have sacrificed a lot. They may serve on a foreign land, and they may come back to their families. But there's always something within their life, a scar, things that they have seen that they could never comprehend, and they deal with it eternally. Internally, when they evaluate what they have seen, sometimes they're very quiet. Sometimes they have to go through a lot of therapy. Sometimes when they see their friends and see the issues of life on a battlefield, it is never going to be the same. We look at men and women that have served with honor and distinction. But at the same time, Paul uses the same analogy of a soldier as we, as Christians, should be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, he uses four analogies. The first is as a teacher, one that teaches and instills instruction within people's lives. The second is a soldier, how we should be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And then the third is a farmer, how we have to plant and how we have to be diligent in our work ethic. And the last analogy is an athlete, how we need to train our bodies and how we need to be taken care of within our lives. In those four analogies on this Veterans Day, we're going to take the soldier. And it's found in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And there's four words in these two verses that I would like to point to your attention. In verse 3 it says, You therefore must endure. Hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him to be in a soldier. So there's four words I'd like to communicate. The first is the word enlisted, as the last E word in that scripture, enlisted. Those that enlisted, we need to please God. You know, the enlistment aspect of the military is very difficult. It is a decision in today's society that you have to make a decision that I want to sacrifice or I want to give up or maybe I want to get a college degree and I want to go through the military to get that. You may have aspirations, but in the middle of those aspirations could be all kinds of heartache and turmoil and your dreams and, and your desires could have all changed. I have a a personal story that I'd like to share with you. And it's a story that, uh, in, in, you know, in, in most people's lives, there's a ah moment where you know when you're going through that, you will never forget that moment. I, I have a, a niece. Her name is Heather. And um, she married this army guy by the name of Jason Melton. And uh, Wamego is like, 20 miles from Fort Riley, so we always had all kinds of army guys around uh, Wamego, Manhattan area, and, and Heather fell in love with Jason, and, and they called me up, and they said, Bruce, we'd like uh, for you to perform the ceremony, so I had the privilege of going down and, and uh, uh, doing the marriage counseling and talking to him, and, and also performing the ceremony back in, um, I think it was 2005. And uh, in doing that, I, I kept on asking Jason some questions. And I said, what are, what are your aspirations in the military? He said, I'd like to retire the military. I'd like to uh, spend 20 years in the military and, and uh, retire military. Well, he was deployed into Iraq in uh, 2005. And uh, uh, he was married for just a little over a year. And he was deployed in Iraq. And, and there was an IED um, uh, right beside his Humvee, and it exploded. And he uh, enlisted in 2002. This took place in 2006. And uh, it, it scarred him for life. It scarred him for life. He was never the same. He couldn't do uh, his military job. He was, he was maimed physically, emotionally, and psychologically. And in that time that uh, he was... Uh, going through his time, my father passed away in 2007. So Jason was going through his rehab, and my father passed away. And in that year and a half where Jason was doing his rehab, my father and him started doing a lot of talking. My dad was 
uh, military. He was Navy, and, and Jason was Army, and they uh, shared a lot of conversation where my dad and I never talked one time about his military background and what he did. So they had about a year and a half of, of talking, and, and uh, my dad passed away. And I had the privilege of doing my dad's funeral. And I stood up, and uh, I was sharing the love of Christ and what Christ can do. And here Jason was sitting in the audience, and he had his full military uniform on. Here this guy had a dream, his aspirations, and it was, um, it was crushed. We get done with the military, we get done with the service, and uh, people were being escorted out. And Jason did something that was my awe moment. I thought I did a good job at the funeral. What Jason did trumped anything I could ever say or do. Jason walks up to this casket with tears coming down his face takes off his purple heart that was pinned on his chest and puts it on my dad's chest, steps back and salutes him. I was sitting there and I was watching that moment of a kindred spirit between two military men. Jason, with his tears coming down his eyes, saluted him. And he said, I loved him. I loved what he taught me. And I loved our stories and our connection. This purple heart would just sit in a box at my house. And it means so much to him. It means so much for me to give it to him. In a few minutes, they closed the casket. They wheeled him off. And he was buried. We went to the house, as we always do after funerals, and we sit down and talked. And it was one of those things that you wonder, oh, why would you do that? It wasn't your dad. He said, "There's something about military, that brotherhood. There's something about a common bond." when you go through stuff and you talk about stuff that you'll never forget. That awe-awe moment for me was watching a man that I respect, a man that I performed his ceremony with my niece, and he loved her. And he went through a major issue within his military career. Now he's not in the military anymore, but he sacrificed. When you think about war, and you think about veterans. You think about what men and women go through and the scars that they have that they may never talk about or that may be physically evident within their life. We have to say thank you. We have to say thank you to them for what we have and what they honor and what they do is uncomprehendable. But they're men and women of courage tenacity and they can teach us some things and when Paul is using this analogy of a soldier I want to take these four words and the first word as we talked about was enlist when we enlist into God's work we are soldiers enlisted to honor those that have called us we are supposed to honor Christ when we are enlisted into his service. We are called by God to do great things for him. When we are enlisted into God's service, it is the same way that Paul is communicating that we as soldiers should be enlisted into the government or enlisted into the army or into the air force or into the marines. It takes work. It takes dedication. That first two or three months of, of boot camp, it is hard work. And so often in church world, when we enlist, we raise our hand and we give our life to Christ and we try to do what God wants us to do. And all we have is we are now in God's family. I believe when we enlist into God's family, it means more 
then we're saved going to heaven. We are called to be soldiers of the Most High. We are called to do something greater than we can do by ourselves. We're not just enlisted to go to heaven. We are called to be God's servants, God's soldiers, his army, to get involved in the work, not just to come to church, not just to be happy, not just to enjoy, but to serve, to get in and to take effort and to do what God has called us to do. We are soldiers in Christ's army. The greatest army that has ever been established is the church. Are we enlisted or are we enjoying I don't think the soldiers are enjoying war. Listen to this quote. General Sherman, you don't know the horrible aspects of war. I've been through two wars and I know. I've seen cities and homes in ashes. I've seen thousands of men lying on the ground, their dead faces looking up in the skies. I tell you, war is hell. But yet Paul says, we as the church, we're in a war. Does the war just take place on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock? No, that's not where the war is. What we are supposed to do is we are supposed to take what God has called us into our hands and engage into a community, have a purpose within our life. We need to be enlisted, but not just enlisted, but we are supposed to be trained to do what God has called us to do. The second thing is endure, is endure. You therefore must endure, what's the next word? Hardships, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Endure hardships. It's not going to be easy. If we're going to be a soldier for Christ, It is not going to be easy. We are going to have catastrophic events that take place within our life. Some of us will get derailed. Some of us will have major issues. Sometimes we have to endure hardships. It's not going to be a piece of cake. It's not going to be the easiest thing that we've ever done. Paul says to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, we must be ready to endure. We must be ready to fight. We must be ready to deal with the issues on hand. And what we have to deal with is when we endure the hardships, we have to know that we are doing it for the cause of Jesus Christ. Not just for our own self. Not just for what I think we should do. But what is it that Christ wants us to do? James reminds us in James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, When troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to to grow. So often we think about the hardships or we think about the stuff that we go through and we say, oh, it's just happenstance. It's just things that take place. You know, Satan, nothing more wants us to trip up. He wants us to do nothing more than to give up. We must endure. We must endure. And the third thing is engage. We must engage. I think Our culture today in Christianity is causing us to be very passive. We we think of church as an entity that we come to in order to get enlightenment from, in order to get our morality on course. We think about it to get inspired so God can bless us. And if I do what the pastor says, or if I understand what the Bible says, and I do these things, God will sprinkle down his blessing on us, and I will be completely satisfied and happy. And we get our morality and our character based on what we think we should do. And, but the Bible says in this, he says, Therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, and warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. When we're talking about engaging... I'd like to ask you a question. Who is it and what is it that you inspire to do and to help? If I would ask you, are there five people as a believer in Jesus Christ into God's family, into God's army, are there five people that you can say right now, they are better off spiritually because I know them? 
Can you give me some people that you say, I have ministered to them individually? Can you give me five people that you can say that I, I bit my knee beside them and I prayed for them and I led them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? So often we think church is a place where we worship, a place where we enjoy, but Paul is communicating, if we're going to be a soldier for Jesus Christ, we have to engage. It's not about coming to church. It's about going out, sharing our faith, knowing what we believe, getting in the trenches and helping people become followers of Christ. If we do not do that, what we have become, we have become a society or a culture of people that are enjoying church, we can lift up our hands and we can praise our God and we can listen to a sermon, but we're not changing people's lives. But when somebody is in need, we are called to be soldiers. We may not bear weapons, but what we bear is bigger than a weapon. We bear the love and the forgiveness of Jesus. You know, the church is the greatest army that has ever been established. We have the greatest power. We have the greatest volunteer base. We have the greatest commander-in-chief. We have the ability to change people's lives. We have the ability not to win a war on a continent, but we have the ability to win the war for eternity. When somebody closes their eyes and they take their last breath, and you had the ability and the opportunity to come alongside them, to open up the very word of God and to share with them the forgiveness and the grace of God, and they've accepted Jesus because of your testimony, you won. You won that battle. You've given to them the greatest thing that they could ever have, and that's our salvation. It's a soldier. We must get in. We must engage and the last thing that he talks about, though, is entangled. He talks about being entangled. Uh, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. What is all that about? Entangled. Uh, how many of you guys, you or your parents used to go trapping? You used to go raccoon trapping or, or beaver trapping out in the woods? Anybody ever do that? Okay. It's kind of gross, so if you're a PETA fan, uh, just cover your eyes. So my dad would have these raccoon traps and he'd open them up and he'd put a little bait in there and, and the raccoons would come in and guess what they would do either the front leg or their back leg would get caught in this trap right so they're sitting there and they're, they're running around and their legs are flapping and so for maybe two or three hours the raccoon or is trapped in this in this trap and dad would have to come over and somehow graciously end this animal's poor life but he he'd take the the animal out of the out of the trap the word ensnared or entrapped, is that same mindset. That is what Satan does to us. He snares us. He entraps us. He puts a trap in waiting. And what we do is we start playing around and we get caught in a trap. Snaps. We're caught. We're busted. We're just sitting there waiting for the end to come. Paul is saying, if we are a soldier, we cannot be entrapped with the things of this world. We must be focused on the very things of God because Satan wants to snare us. He wants to entrap us. He wants to come, cause harm to us. And Satan uses religion as his biggest playground to cause disharmony and chaos in our lives. Can somebody give me an amen to that? Amen. See, somebody would say, Bruce, are you religious? I said, no, I'm not religious. I would say Bruce is a Christian. Religion has sent more people to hell than this world could ever think about. Christianity trumps religion. What I want them to know 
is I want them to know that I am a follower of the Most High. I am put as a soldier into God's army. I understand the snares. I understand the, the entrapments. I understand what we can be focused on. I understand that. But what I have to do is if I'm going to be a soldier of the Most High, I have to understand I am enlisted. I have voluntarily put my confidence and my resources in His army. I enlisted. I asked Him to be my Lord. He didn't force me to enlist. There's not a draft in Christianity. I gave my life to Christ. Amen? Amen? If you gave your life to Christ, you have voluntarily enlisted yourself into God's army. He said, if you have enlisted yourself into God's army, you must do some things. You must endure. There's going to be things that you don't like. There's going to be people that you don't like what they do. There's going to be things in the church that you don't understand why they're doing it. But we are not in it for you. This is an army, and an army has one objective, and that's to win the war, and the objective of the war is to take people, you, me, family, friends, our co-workers, our other students, to the saving knowledge of Christ, so when they pass away, they go to heaven. That is our war. Our war is not to enjoy church. Our war is to use church to change the world. And if we don't do that, we are not enlisted into God's army, and we are not enduring we're not doing what God has called us to do. And then he said, engage. Engage on purpose, on task, have a plan, and do it. It's easy in church to come, to watch, to enjoy, and not to participate. But if you are enlisted into his army, there's going to be hard times, but you have to engage. We do not have a reason not to do what God has called us to do. Complacency into God's army is rebellion. What we must do is we must understand what does God want us to do and how can we accomplish that goal? Where can I go? What can I do? Where can I serve? What part of God's army does he call me to do? And do not let me get entangled with the mess, with the junk of life. Satan wants to trip you up. Satan wants you to become of no effect. He wants you to lose your joy. He wants you to lose everything that you have ever striven for. But what? How does a soldier do that? Train their life, they leave their families. They go on a deployment, whether it's a year, two years, three years, many times over a period of time, they're gone. Why? It's because they have an allegiance. Allegiance to their word. Allegiance to this country. They have an allegiance to freedom. And as we look at our allegiance to Christ, we may not be thrown in jail if we do not do what God calls us to do. We may not go AWOL. Government may not be looking at us and for us. But we have a greater commander-in-chief. And that greater commander-in-chief says this. Paul says this about him. You, therefore, must endure. You have to. People's lives are at stake. You must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life because we're not of this world. We're aliens of this world. Nobody entangles himself of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. I have one objective. I want to please God. I can't say anything else. Jesus died for me. He shed his blood for my sins. I accepted him as my Lord and my Savior, and I said, Lord, I am yours. Forgive me. And at that moment, I said, enlist me into your kingdom, into your army. Enlist me. I want to be a follower of you. And he said, are you sure you know what that means? 
does not mean that you're just going to say, here I am and I'm going to go to heaven when I die. It means it's work. It means there's going to be things that you have to do. It means you have to train. It means you have to endure hardships. It's not going to be a piece of cake. You're not just going to close your eyes and accept Jesus one day and die and go to heaven the next day. It is, I die to myself. The Bible says, born again. I say no to the things of my past and yes to the things of my future. I am born again for a purpose and a plan. Are we sure we want to do that? And I believe our churches are full of people that have a desire to put on the uniform of Jesus Christ. They have a desire. But they don't have what it takes. They know about Jesus. But they have no idea who Jesus is. They have no idea that Jesus died on the cross. They have no idea that Jesus is calling them to do something bigger than they could ever imagine. We get the concept that the war that I'm in is for my happiness. Me, the soldier that I'm in, is to make everybody happy. Everybody like me. I get to do what I want to do and be happy and God blesses me and everything's wonderful. You know, I wish Christianity was that easy. But Paul says Christianity is a fight. And he uses the analogy of a soldier with hardships that's going to have entanglements that we're going to have to endure. And the bottom line, he says, because you want to please Jesus. I don't believe sometimes we understand what Jesus wants. Jesus does want us to be happy. He does. But what Jesus ultimately wants, he wants you and me to get into the fight, to understand there's people around us that need you. People are dying and going to hell without you. And if you could take those five people and you can say, I want to make five people eternally going to heaven because I got involved in their life. I ministered to them. I loved them. And when they close their eyes, when they stand at that casket, they can do what Jason did. They can say, he impacted my life. Everything I have, everything I've gone through, it's because of him. And I want to give my reward to him. Because I can tell you, this world stinks. Junk happens all the time. And I am so pleased to say this is not the end. This is only the comma before the future. I do not want to sacrifice today for tomorrow. I want to use today in order to take people with me for tomorrow. A soldier somebody that fights, somebody that's disciplined, somebody that sacrifices, somebody that's prepared, somebody that knows whom they serve. The church, if we are going to be soldiers for Jesus Christ, it can't be about you. It can't be about me. It has to be about our commander-in-chief. It is all about Jesus. And if it ever gets to the point that we are not serving Jesus, but we're doing what we want instead of what he wants, we have missed the mark. So on this Veterans Day, I want to thank all of the men and women that have served in our armed forces. We are who we are today because of the sacrifices that you have made in the past. But on this Veterans Day, to the church, we cannot be who God wants us to be unless the body of Christ engages. Unless the body of Christ does something bigger than themselves. Until the church decides it's not about coming to church. 
It's about taking what Christ has done within their life and giving it to somebody else, learning enough to share our faith, to minister to somebody else, to lead somebody else to the saving knowledge of Christ. If the body of Christ, the church, the greatest power upon this planet, has the greatest force within us, the Holy Spirit that lives within us, if we do not get up and exercise God's power, we are going to continue to be a declining entity in our culture today, and our culture will not rely on Christ, they'll rely on other things. But if the church becomes relevant because of what we have, we have the answer. We have our faith. We have Christ. We have the most relevant answer to the need, and that's the forgiveness of their sins. We have the answer to a culture that is dying. The church in, re in reality, in our perspective, is losing its influence within our culture. Now, why is that? It's because the church has become quiet in the issues of morality. It's because we have been quiet on the issues of what God wants our church to do. We have been ensnared to the idea of popularity and numerical growth instead of focused on training to change the world for Jesus Christ. We have to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Our culture depends on the body of Christ. Jesus has initiated the church. He's given us the plan. He's given us the idea. He's given us the ability to impact the world. We cannot we cannot be quiet. We have to be the good soldiers of Jesus Christ, the ambassadors, the representation of Jesus Christ on this earth, in this church, in this city. Are you a good soldier of Jesus Christ? If not, I pray that you'll get on your heart before God and you'll say, I want, I want the Lord to work within me. I want those five people to know that I love them and I will do whatever it takes to share my faith and to give to them the hope that changes their life. Give to them the idea that God can radically fix their life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we thank you for your love to us. And Lord, we thank you for fixing us and helping us and loving us and Lord, we, we are so thankful for our past and we thank you for our soldiers. Thank you for our country. But we are here for a purpose and that purpose is to take people and to open up their hearts and their lives so they can see you, so you can change them and love them and help them. Allow us to be faithful soldiers of Jesus Christ to change people's lives to minister to them, to love them. Forgive us where we fail you. Allow us to honor you, and we are so thankful for you and what you've done for us. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen.